the volume, you bring the bass down, the bass is too high. Okay, it's still looks there. Bring the treble up and the bass down. And they push the way up. Okay. Shatavyanana Vishrasta Apuni Sangrasya Uriya Arta Yaga Chani Dhamun Bhava Yasa Parishrama Translation O magnanimous Uddhava, by his neglect of these demigods, he completed his stock of piety and all his wealth. He accumulated of his repeated exhaustive endeavors was totally lost. So Krishna is speaking to Uddhava. Right? And he's speaking about this Brahman. Purport. The Brahmanist stock of Pai became like a withered branch that had no longer given fruits or flowers. So the Jiva Goswami comments that the Brahmana had a choice of piety directed at the Supreme Lord with hopes of liberation. That pure portion of the branch of his piety remained unwithered, eventually giving him the fruit of knowledge. From the plan to the Sri Chaitanya, the Lord is Sun, Stop, and then the end of Rute, Swayam Rupa, the Lamb, the Yam, the Dati, Swayam Rati, the Mahu, Vishnu Mahadaya, Krishna, the Sai, Rute, Sri Mate, Bhakti, Vedanta, Swami, Tivane, Namaste, Sarasvati, Hare, Bhagavadi, Pachavine, Nirvishe, Sarasimavadi, Pastrakya, Hare, Sitarane, Shri Krishna, Chaitanya, Prabhu, Nityananda, Shri Advaita, Dhanakara, Shivasu, Gaur, Rakhya Guru. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. So, hearing about this Brahmana, province of Bhavanti. Bhavanti is in the area of Ujjayi. That's one of the old names of Ujjayi is Bhavanti. So this is his personality is being talked about by Krishna to Uddhava, explaining how renunciation Force renunciation works. This renunciation can be voluntarily accepted due to knowledge or experience, or one can be forced to renounce. Prabhupada talks about that forced renunciation. There's a man, he has a stock of grains on the side of the road. And he's selling his grains, and uh, but then all of a sudden a big, strong wind comes, blows his grains up in the sky. And the grains are flying in the sky, and while they're flying, he said, "My dear Lord, please accept my offering." <laughs> That's kind of a renunciation where you're forced to accept the fact that you can't do anything otherwise. That's not real renunciation. Renunciation has to be voluntary. We see the situation here of a person, obviously he had a good karma. There's no question about that. You can see that. Both in the spiritual sense and also in the material sense. The spiritual sense here I've said that although his material good karma reached the end, and everything fell. And because of that, he lost everything. Still, he had some, a little bit of spiritual karma. In other words, somewhere within his existence, he had the desire to renounce. 
And that, that remained. And that gave him some knowledge on how to deal with the situation. And that will be coming up. But here, speaking about what is being spoken right now, is that this person, and we see in the material world, people have a lot of material things, power, position, wealth, followers, name, and so many different accolades coming by pious activities. Nobody gets anything but hard work. Too hard, two people work very hard. And one person gets nothing or little, the other person gets everything. Or one person doesn't work hard at all. And all this thing, everything comes by way of the highest activities in the previous birth or even in this birth. Or and the other person struggles, strains, tries so many different ways to somehow procure some kind of power position. Still, nothing happens. So destiny is powerful. The only way one can change destiny is when it becomes a devotee. Otherwise, destiny is all powerful. So we see here, people who have such position, but there's one element that's missing. And this is the element here in this person. He was not kind. He wasn't coming. This is the nature of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Krishna has everything. He controls everything. He owns everything. But he's kind. And because he's kind, we worship him. We don't worship him because he's, he has so many things. Some people do. They want things from God, not God himself. And so they worship God. Or they even might adore a great personality in this world in order to get what that personality can give that. And sometimes we use the use cliche, a person is not your friend, but they're friend with your money. They're more looking at what they can get from what you got rather than being something in some relationship with you. And we see that all the time now. People have position themselves in order to get something from others. There was not much relationship between the individuals. It's the material thing that brings them together, at least temporarily. But if a person is not kind, who cares? But if a person is kind and generous by nature, even if they don't have much, they're desirable. Their association is desirable, their, their friendship is desirable. So we can see that element of kindness is so and this was completely absent in this personality here. He didn't care about his relatives, he didn't care about his friends, he followed the rules and regulations, he didn't even care about his own body. He was such a miser. The devotees were telling Prabhupada one story with one man. Uh, he had he had apparently nothing. He was living in a very poverty stricken condition, and his house was broken down, and his, his area was always dirty, and he never had many clothes. But when he died, they found out he had millions of dollars in the bank. <laughs> he never spent that in a He was so miserly that he would just deprive himself and others of anything. It's just like, a, it's kind of like a sickness, a disease. Papa said that happens in India too. He said many of these beggars, they have nice bank balances, big accounts, but they look like they don't have anything. Of course, they have plans for the future. <laughs> so he, because he was such what we say, hard-hearted, cruel, insensitive, and he didn't follow any principles of kindness or etiquette that is based on human nature. Nobody liked him. Nobody liked him. And gradually, because he neglected the higher powers, didn't offer anything to the demigods, the demigods 
uh, completed his stuff with piety and all his wealth was gone by the power of providence. So everything in the material world, of course, is temporary. And whatever one may have, one may use in the service of others or in the service of the Lord. Otherwise, what value does anything have that one has? If one doesn't use what they have in the service of others, or in the service of the Lord, materially and spiritually, then they live a very wretched existence. It says that there are three modes of materialization, and people's mentalities are somewhat geared, or what we say, controlled by the type of mode that they are connected with. And how they think and how they live is somewhat facilitated by the mode of intimidation. So to use a little bit of a understanding, a person in the mode of ignorance thinks, if I can get something, then I can do something. And if I can do something, then I can be something. So getting becomes the main thing in the mode of ignorance. In the mode of passion, person thinks that I can do something, then I can get something, and then I can be something. The person in the mode of goodness thinks if I can be something, then I can do something, then I can get something. So you see how the mode is actually from the ignorance to goodness is completely reversed, just the mindset. So a devotee is somewhat situated in the, in the element of the world of goodness, it's all about character. It's not about what you have, or even what you can do. Because what you can do really depends on what you, either your pious activities in your previous life or by the mercy of the Supreme Personality of God. The character is everything. Therefore, although he had so much, he had no character. They didn't care about what they else. So, and because of that, he lost everything. But still, something was there in his life that brought about some future good fortune. And it says that he, he had this element of desire for the moral solution. Although it was buried amongst all his mean mentality, it was there. And when he lost everything, it became revealed. And so Prabhupada, not Prabhupada, the devotees of Prabhupada said, eventually the fruit of knowledge is somehow fructified. You know? And we find that here also in the other of Gantel, in the story of the, the 24 gurus. And, uh, yeah, in this verse, I think it's it's also Krishna speaking about the 24 gurus. And one of the gurus is Pingala, the prostitute. And she also showed renunciation in the same way. When she could not facilitate anyone for her services, she became more and more unhappy. And finally, when some, nothing was actually happening, and her whole life economically was falling apart because she simply depended on her profession for her livelihood. And when her profession was no longer facilitated, she felt a sense of <coughs> loss. But finally, at one point, when she realized that I have nothing, and there's nothing I can do about it, she became happy. <laughs> Say that you feel like you're wrong. You realize that, all right, I don't have anything, but at least I can take shelter of the Supreme Person of God. Higher than happiness, people want to be happy. They don't try to be happy, try to be satisfied. Satisfaction is greater than happiness because happiness you have to work for, at least in the material sense. And happiness in the spiritual sense comes by way of devotional service. But for 
much for the materialist or even for the body, sometimes we see the bodies are a little bit unhappy or unsatisfied. The satisfaction comes by accepting whatever Krishna arranges. I remember I was just recently in, in uh, Italy. It was not so recent. It was in July of this year. And uh, they were cooking prasadam for me every day. And I couldn't eat any of it. <laughs> they kept asking me, what do you want? And I was telling them and they were coming up with something better. And so lunch every day was like, uh, so on the last day, I thought, all right, maybe we'll get lucky. The last day will be something. So the last day was worse than the first three days. <laughs> so when I, when I realized it, I thought, Jai, Krishna, okay, thank you. <laughs> when I did that, I mean, I was complaining in my mind, you know, it was like, it's not that bad. Finally, I said, all right, this is what you want, Krishna, I'll take it. And I felt, wow, I felt great. I felt this relief came, forced renunciation. But it was a kind of satisfaction that allowed me to accept the situation, even though it apparently was something different than I wanted. So that this element of satisfaction can be acquiesced and can be brought about at any time. How can be satisfied? And satisfaction is, the, is one of the austerities mentioned in the uh, Bhagavad Gita as of the features of the mind. Material world means dissatisfaction. Nobody's satisfied. No matter how much people get, or really how many things people achieve, or do, there's always this dissatisfaction. The Prabhupada would say the material world means satiation but no satisfaction. The spiritual life means no satiation but it's always satisfying. Always satisfying. Why? Because even though on the external level things may not be, what we say, ideal, still the body can always take shelter of Krishna and take Krishna. And I realized that whatever Krishna arranges is perfect. And there's something in there for me to understand. And so the Savanti Brahman, now he's got a little bit of knowledge left, although he lost everything. And we'll go on to the future verses to see how much, how intelligent and how wise. So renunciation or too much attachment to material things, and there's a disqualification for actually spiritual life. There's two disqualifications, too little or too much. If one has too little, one cannot maintain their body, therefore they cannot maintain their body and their soul nicely, it becomes difficult to perform devotional service. When we see people who have hardly anything, they're mostly struggling to maintain themselves. And it's really hard for them to practice spiritual life because the most important thing is to maintain. And those who have too much, they become, what we say, overwhelmed or just diverted from the path of bhakti or they never understand the value of bhakti because they think that having success in the material life is, is something that will bring them happiness. So we have the example of Nalakubera and Manigriva and the Dhammadar prayer. They were so wealthy. They were, how wealthy were they? They were the sons of Kubera. Who's Kubera? Kubera. He's so rich. Not only is he rich, he lends money to Krishna. When Krishna wants to get married, the story of Balaji and uh, Tirupati. The whole story is that when uh, Brigham Muni kicked uh, uh, Lord Vishnu in the chest, Lakshmi became very upset and she cursed the Brahmins to become poor. 
And then she, and not only that, she left the spiritual world and went to the material world. Now uh, Vishnu is without his Lakshmi, so he decides to find Lakshmi. So he incarnates as Srinivas, a poor Brahmin. And the whole pastime is Srinivas is trying to catch up to Lakshmi. Finally he does. And then they decide to get together and get married, but he's broke. He's got no money. So he's thinking, what can I do? And then Kubera sees the situation and offers that lender some money, but with interest. <laughs> so that whole Balaji temple now is so rich like. They paid the they paid the loan, but now it's still paying the interest. So that's why well, that temple is one of the richest temples in India because they're paying the interest of Krishna water from uh, Kuvera. There's a nice story connected with that temple. Uh, I think you might have heard the story before. One man came into the temple and he had a very valuable diamond ring. And he gave the, the ring to Balaji. But when the Pajari accepted it, he became a little greedy and stole the ring. Now he stole the ring and he's thinking, what can I do? Well, I have to find some place where I can get some money for this ring. But it's too dangerous for me to do it in the area. So he, he travels 100 kilometers away, finds some little jewelry shop in one small town, walks into the jewelry shop, shows the jeweler the ring, and says, how much do you give me for this? The jeweler says, where did you get that? I gave that to Babaji. <laughs> Krishna let him write where he's supposed to go. Don't try to cheat Krishna. <laughs> so, yeah, but uh, this idea of wealth, I mean, there's so many types of what we say opulences, but one can somehow run it gain and one can also be given. So people have various types of opulences and they become very much enamored by those opulences. Pride, a, a kind of pride comes from these opulences. So people are beautiful and they become proud of their beauty. There was one famous uh, movie star, her name was Bridget Bardo. She's, she's still alive, she's almost 100 years old now. But she was famous back in my time when I was a kid. She was popular because of her beauty. And, you know, wherever she would go, she'd be in magazines and so many things. But one day, when she re reached the age of 50, she looked into the mirror and the beauty was fading. And it became such a, let me say, a Thunderbolt on her mind, she thought, oh no, everything I'm living for is also now going and getting old. <laughs> and so she decided not to go out in public anymore. She gave up her whole career because she simply lived for her facial, her bodily beauty. And people become, what we say, proud and think that, oh, but this, this is the material world. And everything we have is, is subject to the element of time. So when they have beauty, when they have learning, when they have good birth in a good family, highest family, good name, or when they have wealth. But we learn from the story of Namadar at Aspine that these two persons, Ramakumar and Panagri, they had so much wealth, but they were proud of their wealth and didn't respect the great soul when he came into the presence. And so, Narada Muni gave them a little mercy and took everything away. So Prabhupada writes, in the purports of this particular pastime, out of all the forms of pride that one may have by way of material existence, wealth is the strongest. Wealth is the strongest form of pride. Because people who are wealthy think that they, they have 
achieve success. They can do anything. They can go anywhere. They can. They can even, you know, control people by their wealth. So this idea of wealth. So everything has to be used in the service of the Lord. Otherwise, it becomes a source of one's entanglement in material energy, and eventually turns into something different. Rather than, and we see people who are wealthy. This is a statistic. Are the most uh, the highest category of people who have mental illnesses. This is a statistic that those who are very wealthy find it very difficult to find happiness. <laughs> if you're a little wealthy, that's okay. If you're very wealthy, that's a problem. <laughs> And one cannot really understand, one cannot, the Bhagavatam explains that if one has a very big golden crown on their head, it's very hard to bow down. It's very hard to bow down because the weight of the crown will keep you down. So nobody bows down. So therefore, this idea of wealth, and we see here, he had so much. So much that he, he didn't care about anybody. His, uh, his wife, his family members, people in general, or even, you know, relatives, no one. So everything was lost. We tell one story. I remember I, go, I had to go to one program in uh, a place called. Beverly Hills, California. It's one of the richest places in America. It was so rich. So one devotee, he knew all these rich people. So he brought me to this program. And they were like people who were, you know, had some connection with Hollywood, psychologists, psychiatrists, people who were, you know, were highly placed. So I'm thinking, how do I preach to these people? <laughs> if I tell them, you know, you're in Maya. <laughs> so I told this one story. And uh, the story is that this one greedy merchant, this is how I started my life. You know, yeah, and, I'm, and I'm sitting there amongst all these rich people and they're dressed quite nicely. They were friends of this one person who knew the devotee, so they came because of his friend and invited him. So they didn't really have any intonation of what they were going to hear or what they were going to experience. So I told a story of this one greedy merchant, and he had four wives. And now he goes to the doctor, the doctor says, My dear sir, you have six months to live. You have terminal disease. There's nothing that can be done. Modern medicine cannot save you. Make your plans to leave. <laughs> so he's thinking, hmm. And he's, you know, because he has such, he's greedy, he's wealthy, he has four wives, he's afraid. And he's very fearful of what's going to happen. He's losing everything. So he goes to the... He has four wives. His favorite wife was the fourth wife. His third wife, a little less favored. Second wife, okay, but not so much. And the first wife, he completely neglected. So he, he goes to his favorite wife, he says, I'm leaving, I'm leaving, will you come with me? She said, Hi, Bob, nice knowing you. That's it, we're finished. So he goes to the third wife, he's begging her, please come with me, I'm also knowing you know, how much I love you. She says, well, once you die, I'm going to get remarried. So she goes, he goes to the second wife, and he's, now he's even more desperate, and he's begging her. She said, well, you know, I can come to the grave and see you off when you die. I'll, I'll do that. And now, 
is only the first wife, the one he completely neglected, the one he never talked to, the one he completely, completely saved, yeah, mistreated. And he came to her and said, that he's embarrassed because he knows how he treated her. Will you come with me? She said, I'll never leave you. <laughs> so then I told the story, who are the four wives? The first wife is the body, the fourth wife. Because when we, when we have to leave this body, the world has to end with the body. The third wife is our possessions. When we die, somebody else gets them. And the uh, second wife of our friends and relatives, they come to the grave, see us off, and say so many nice prayers. But the first wife is Krishna. <laughs> so even though one so I told this story to all these rich people. And I was thinking, I don't know, I'll take a chance, <laughs> see what happens. And you know, every one of them appreciated the story. Because later on, they all told me how miserable they were. <laughs> and we were sitting together in a more relaxed atmosphere after the lecture, and everyone was eating from Shadow. They just told me how, you know, how many times they've been married, <laughs> and how the present situation is miserable, how much money they got, but you know, it's not working out, they have fights with other things. <laughs> like, their whole lives are mess. It was just a mess. So they actually came to this program to see if they could learn something about spirituality that would help them. And which was good. And you find the same thing here. When people can see that the frustration that they have acquired simply by following the way of the world, in other words, trying to somehow or other be successful in material life, and it gives them the complete opposite. Not only does it make them happy, but it makes them miserable. It makes them miserable. Unless they use everything in the service of the Lord, or at least a portion of it. So we see here, Somehow or other, we don't know his karma, but he had some <laughs> some shikriti there that was somewhat not destroyed by his, let me say, his miserliness and his lack of prop, performing proper worship to the higher labors. <clears throat> that was still there. That gave him some hopes where he could actually move on and actually become happy. Devotion service. And I don't want to speak too much because the whole story is yet to be unraveled in the future verses. But this is an interesting <coughs> lesson. <coughs> How people become so much attached to their material things that it becomes everything. Material things have value and that they can support one's body and mind, but they have they have they are not the source of happiness. Happiness is relationships. Happiness is relationships. He gave up all the relationships, he sacrificed relationships for material things. The people who have nice relationships with others, and ultimately, of course, the perfect relationship or the ideal relationship, or the desirable relationship is our relationship with Krishna. That's the most important. And when that becomes strong, then everything, every other relationship becomes nice, or becomes a source of happiness, and a source of service also. And you use those relationships as an opportunity to serve Krishna by serving others through serving, serving Krishna by serving others. And that brings happiness and satisfaction. Not having material things. It's nice. Now we can see, you know, I can see it. I've been coming to India since 1994, practically every year. 
for the last 25 years. And India is moving in the direction of material opulences more and more and more. But we find, if you follow the statistics, there's more and more difficulties that are coming by way of that. More crime, more drug abuse, more unemployment. People had employment just by way of the by nature, and now people have to struggle to be forced to live in big cities and find, try to find jobs. And so, when spirituality takes a backseat to material progress, then material difficulties become come along with that material progress. So many things. So therefore, it's our job as devotees to preach this Krishna consciousness. Because people still have that sukriti, but they're being led and misdirected by the leaders of the country to think that now, because we have somehow or other not been able to develop economically, we have to focus on that as the most important thing in our life. More e and economics leads to sense gratification. And sense gratification leads to frustration. Too much. So as devotees, you'll find that there's a lot of potential of anti brahmins out there. We can preach Krishna consciousness. And explain that actually your real wealth is in your spirituality. This is, this is wealth. You know, we hear that saying, whether or not Maharaj uses it occasionally in his lectures. He said, if you lose your money, you lose nothing. If you lose your health, you lose something. And if you lose Krishna, there's nothing left. So health is important, but ultimately, the ultimate health is spiritual health. <laughs> okay. So any questions or comments? Yeah. Uh, attachment, detachment, renunciation. 